Dear Lord, thank you so much for this Sabbath, for this time we've been able to spend away from our work with you. Thank you for this time we've been able to spend with each other. I just pray that you would give us, you send the Holy Spirit on this room and on us. Help us to learn exactly what you would want us to learn about your scripture tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I was asked to uh, give some things that I liked about the book of Exodus. And uh, so I chose three things that stand out to me about what I like about the book. The first is one of the first memory verses that I remember learning, and that's in Exodus 20. Uh, that's Exodus 28 through 11. That's the Sabbath commandment. And not just that, but the whole Ten Commandments. And one thing that stands out to me is something that Mrs. White says, that all of God's biddings are enablings. And what I see here in the Ten Commandments is God saying, not, he's not telling us, don't do this, don't do that. But if we surrender to him, this is what we will be like. We will naturally be like this. So those, while they may sound like uh, negative commands, they're actually promises. In Exodus 33, well, between Exodus 20 and Exodus 33, you will find the construction and description of the tabernacle. And throughout the tabernacle, we see God's plan of salvation. Um, I look at the tabernacle as the plan of salvation in, in the form of theater. It's, it's an acting out. It's an illustration of what God is doing for us. Uh, his sacrifice, there's nothing that we are doing. It's all him. The Jews were saved by faith looking forward to the cross and we're saved by faith looking back to the cross. In Exodus 33, uh, 12 to 23, this is where Moses asks to see God's glory. Uh, he has been up on the mountain top before in this instance, he's actually wanting to see God. And, but what God does say, he's not going to show him his face, but he will make all his goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And in there we see that God's glory is not his power necessarily, but it's his character. Thank you, Peter. Some good thoughts to get us thinking before we actually um, begin going through with Dr. Davidson uh, through the book of Exodus. Now it's time for a bit of interaction. Uh, we have our scripture memory portion that we do now. For those of you who have come uh, many times, you know how this works. For those of you who have not been here before, you'll find out how it works. But since this is the first time we're starting uh, a new book of the Bible, I'm just going to be handing out text today. I'll need three volunteers, uh, one child and two adults. And basically, you're raising your hand if you commit to coming the next time we have the next meeting, which is not actually going to be next week because we have Pathfinder investiture here. Uh, but it'll be on the 18th. So you'll have two weeks to memorize this text. And then when we get to this portion on the 18th, uh, the three people who volunteer will come up, recite their text, and then another three texts will be handed out for the week that comes previously. So Adventists have traditionally been known, though we hear of it less and less, as people of the book, people who knew their Bibles. You could go to an Adventist back in the day and say, I've been wondering about the second coming and some texts, and an Adventist would be able to say, well, sure, here are some of the Bible texts, and they would be able to go through them with you. But today, it's like, I know where that text is. Well, let me use my phone, and you type in two words, and you're looking. So memorizing Scripture is something that we will have even when our phones are gone, when our computers are gone, when all else fails. Maybe even our Bibles will be taken away from us, but God's Word will remain with us still. So it's important to do this. And then we're going to have some Bible questions, and then we'll hand over the time to Dr. Davidson. So 
Uh, the first one is for a child. I don't see very many children here, but I do see some. It's uh, towards the beginning of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, and it's probably a very famous verse because the book of Exodus begins with this kind of concept. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Do I have a volunteer who will be here on the 18th? Christina will. Some of them are getting volunteered by their older siblings, which is great to see. <laughs> okay, so for the adults, we have here Exodus 2 from Exodus chapter 3. The first one is chapter 3, verse 11, and it reads, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? That is all. Do I have a volunteer? Thank you, Myrna. She raised her hand over there. She's right next to Brenda Kish. And Exodus 3.14, a very uh, good verse in many ways. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this is particularly, this phrase is very important because in the New Testament, Jesus, particularly in the Gospel of John, uses this terminology a lot, the I am statement. So Exodus 3.14, do I have a volunteer for this one, for the 18th? Thank you so much. Okay, now if the kids, all the kids would like to come up, anyone 16 and below, for the Bible questions. They're on the book of Exodus. Make it 19. <laughs> 18. <laughs> Coming up, help, help your younger siblings in case they get stuck. But the way we do this, we're going to do several children's questions. And for the children, they only have to give me the answer. Then we're going to go to adult questions. And the adults have to be a little bit harder. You have to not only give me the answer, but you have to give me the scriptural passage where it's found. So I want to know the answer, and I want to hear an answer like it's found in Exodus chapter such and such verses or verse such and such. So that way you have to find it in your Bible. Okay, so the first question is a really easy one to start off with. How many brothers and sisters did Moses have, and what were their names? Joshua? Um, one brother and one sister. And what were their names? Miriam and Aaron. Did you get it right? Absolutely. Well done. Okay. So when Moses was attending to his father-in-law's flock, what unusual sight attracted his attention and caused him to investigate what was going on? When he was there in the wilderness attending his father-in-law's flock, what did he see that was unusual? A burning bush. Did she get it right? Absolutely. The bush that did not burn up. Okay, so this one might be a little bit harder. When Moses and Aaron first went to meet Pharaoh, their message was, let my people go. God speaking here. They said, God said, let my people go that they may do what? Worship me. Did he get it right? Yes, he did. Very well. They, he actually said to hold a feast to me in the wilderness, but that is, he wanted them to come out so that they would worship him. Okay, finally, this last one's going to test your knowledge of the Ten Commandments. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament writes that the fifth commandment is the first commandment with promise. What does the fifth commandment talk about and what is, what is the promise that it contains? Do one of the older ones want to take a guess? What does the fifth commandment talk about? Do you know that one? What's the fourth commandment talk about? The Sabbath. So what comes right after the Sabbath? I'll give you a hint. It begins with the word honor. 
Okay. Honor your father and your mother. Okay, so then what is the promise that's associated? Why should you do that? Do you know the rest of the sentence there? Does anyone else know? Do you know? Oh, yes. That your days may be long in the kingdom of God. That your days may be long on the land which the Lord your God gives you. So to have a long, good life, that's why you should honor your mother and your father. And the Apostle Paul references this in the New Testament as the first commandment with promise. So thank you so much. That's all the questions. You guys did an excellent, excellent job. And now you can relax as your parents start to worry and flick through the pages. So let's go to uh, the adult questions here. In the book of Exodus, since we're doing Exodus, all of these will be from the book of Exodus, which limits your shuffling back and forth somewhat. But in the book of Exodus, God through Moses specifically calls two people, Bezaliel, Bezaliel, the son of Uri, and Aholiab, the son of Ahishamach. For what purpose did God call these two men? There's a specific instance where God names these two men by name and the families that they come from. Wow, an answer already. Uh, in Exodus 36, 2, uh, they were gifted artisans in whom the, a heart that the Lord had put wisdom and everybody's heart was stirred to come and do the work. Okay, very good. I also had ex towards the end of Exodus 35 as well, but they're probably mentioned in 36. Both of them were called artisans. I think one was gifted in gold, silver, bronze, and jewels, and the other one was gifted in tapestry. So God called artists, just keep in mind, artists by name, to beautify the temple. Uh, this is wonderful. Okay, which plague fell upon Egypt by an east wind and was removed by a strong west wind? Which plague fell upon Egypt by an east wind and was removed by a strong west wind? You have to find the passage too, sorry. Okay, John here has found it. Okay. Uh, Exodus ten thirteen, Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind on the land that day and all that night. And it was morning and the east wind brought the locust. Okay, and then verse 19. Is it 19? And the Lord turned a very strong west wind which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. Okay, very good. Exodus chapter 10, and it was the locusts. Very good. Okay, God mentions three annual feasts where all men were to appear before the Lord. What were the names of those three feasts? So there were three feasts which are named where all men were to appear before the Lord. What were their names? So we're looking at uh, Exodus 23, verse uh, 14. Three times you shall keep a uh, feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. And then in verse 16, the feast of harvest. And also the feast of ingathering. Okay. Or the end of harvest. So there was the beginning of harvest, the end of harvest, and then the feast of unleavened bread. Thank you. Uh, last question here. How often was Aaron to burn incense on the altar of incense? How often? What were those regulations? Was it once a week, once a month? <laughs> More often than that? And if so, how much? How often? Wow, Christina. 
um, is it Exodus 30, verse 7? Yes. And Aaron, and Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Okay, so every morning and evening, and basically every time he attended the lamps, he was to keep incense burning on it. So, wonderful, a good start to get our minds thinking on the book of Exodus. So I will, I don't know if you want to go up to the pulpit or you'll be here. Okay, I'll hand over the time to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I was very impressed by the knowledge of our children here in this church and also the adults. The uh, book of Exodus is a book that uh, we have a lot to find in the book that the whole rest of the Bible is indebted to. So much is founded upon the book of Exodus. And I actually would like to start with my own question, if you don't mind. Let's see if I can make this work. Another, I didn't know we were going to have Bible trivia questions, so I'm right in, the, right in, the, in harmony with this. And here's, here's my uh, Bible trivia question for the night. Are there any human beings alive today who personally witnessed with their own eyes Israel's exodus from Egypt? So, raise your hand. Yes. All right. Is Moses a human being? And is Moses alive today? You remember he took, as HMS Richards says, he took the sleeper. He went to sleep on Mount, up on top of the mountain, but God raised him up again. So, Moses. Yes, I see another hand. Okay, Enoch. Enoch, is Enoch alive today? And was Enoch alive at the time of the Exodus? And no doubt he looked down and was able to observe the events. So yes, Enoch. So we got Moses. We have Enoch. Yes. All right. That's the next one I had. Is Jesus a human being? Is he alive today? Did he witness the Exodus? He was actually there as the leader in the cloud, moving them forward through the wilderness. And so we've got these three, Moses, Jesus, and Enoch. Anyone else? Well, think about that. And as we uh, go, we'll come back to this question in just a few minutes, because I'm going to suggest there's one more person that we need to add to this list. And so... But before we can add that person, we need to look at some interesting, and I would like to suggest explosive biblical insights that brings out a principle about the Exodus that makes it come alive in a way that has really excited me. And so open your Bibles to Exodus 13. And this is the time of the Passover. And God is giving instructions here through Moses about what should be done when they come into the land of Canaan. After they go through the wilderness and they get to the promised land, what are they supposed to do? Notice verse 5. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. And then verse 8, and you shall tell your son in that day, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Now let's fast forward 40 years. They finally got to the promised land. How many of the adults were still alive? Just two, just Caleb and Joshua that finally got in to the promised land. Almost, I mean, all the rest of that generation died. And so most of the people that went into the promised land 
or at least many of them had actually never been there at the Passover. They were born in the wilderness. And yet, was this still the command that God wanted them to say? Tell your children in that day, this is what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Now you may say, well, God intended for them to go right into the promised land. He didn't intend for that 40-year detour. So let's just check out what some later books tell us. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now it is 40 years later, and Moses is right there at the borders of the promised land, and he's reminding them of the history of God's leading them. And he's reminding them of the, uh, God's giving of the Ten Commandments. And notice what he says, verse 2, The Lord our God made a covenant with us. Again, he includes us when most of the people that he's talking to were born in the wilderness and not in, the, not in, uh, in Egypt or able to see this. And let's see how inclusive he intends it to be. Look at verse 3. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, we should add there only, with only with our fathers, but with us, those who are alive here today, all who are alive. What's he saying? That he wants us to consider that we were, th all of the people that were listening to him, to consider that they were there and that they had the covenant made with them. Now let's look at another text just in the next chapter, chapter 6. Verses 20 to 22. And this is again, when you get into the land, when, you, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Do you hear again how God is telling them to personalize it? To consider as if they were the ones that were slaves in Egypt? Now, I, I offer you my final piece of evidence, and I think this is the conclusive one. Now we go to the end of Joshua's life. Remember, he was one of the only two adults that actually went into the Promised Land, and now he's ready to die. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is reiterating the covenant with the people, and he's actually, God is speaking through Joshua here. God is making a covenant with the people. And notice what God says. Now, this is God's words, the end of Joshua's life. Now, if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to pause, and you add the words after I pause, okay? So, we're starting with verse 6. Then I brought... Who out of Egypt? Your fathers. And who came? You came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued who? Your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And so they cried to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them, and who? Your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Do you hear the back and forth between your fathers and you? Who was it that really saw the exodus? For most of them, it was not them. It was their fathers. But God is trying to tell them by alternating pronouns here, you, your fathers, you, your fathers, that it wasn't just your fathers, not just your forefathers. You were there. You were there. Now I think it's time to add, well, no, I have to throw in one more text, and then the, the study is complete. Galatians 3.29. You can probably say this from memory. If ye be Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If we're Christians, we are spiritual Israelites. We are the descendants of of Abraham. And that means 
that just like Joshua said and Moses said in Deuteronomy and in Joshua, so God says to us today, you were there when the Exodus took place. So can I go back to my trivia question now? Are there any human beings alive today who saw with their own eyes the Exodus? Put your name there. Everyone here can put their own name there. God wants us to consider that we were Pharaoh's slaves. You know, our Hebrew brothers and sisters got this principle. The Passover just happened a few weeks ago, and part of the Passover service as they're sitting around the table on Passover evening, they say, let every Jew consider that they, that we were Pharaoh's slaves and brought, God brought us out of Egypt. You were there. Now, if you're really an old timer like I am, you may remember a television program back when it was black and white, black when I was just a kid, back when we first got a TV and my mom only let me watch two programs every week. One hour of, on Sunday night, 6.30 and 7 o'clock, and the first one at 6.30 was Lassie. I still remember they, off, they advertised Campbell's tomato soup. And so my mom would always fix Campbell's tomato soup on Sunday night as we watched Lassie. And then the next half hour was Walter Cronkite. Before he became a newscaster, he was one who was the announcer for this program called You Are There. And every week we went to some scene in history, whether it be the Battle of Gettysburg or some other great event in history. And it was the most powerful documentary, I think, still that exists because I was, I remember being on the Titanic one week, you know, long before the movie, The Titanic. But in that one half hour, I felt like I was seasick with the experience of the Titanic and everyone got on those lifeboats except for us on TV land and the boat was going down and I could almost feel like the water was pouring right out of the TV set but just before we drowned Walter Cronkite came on and saved the day and said you were there. Now I use both because uh, there were two versions of this program. One it was called You Are There and One You Were There. So it depends upon which season you saw as to what the name was. But God, had a better, God has a better program than Walter Cronkite's You Are There. It's called the Old Testament and especially the book of Exodus. God wants us to make this experience come alive. And so in the next few minutes, I'd like us to imagine I'd like us to strip away our amnesia, not just imagine. We were there. We don't need to imagine it. We just need to take away our, our bad memories so that we can remember what happened. So come with me. Let's come back to that time when we were delivered from Pharaoh's clutches and headed out to the promised land. So we need to just sort of focus in on first, when did the Exodus happen? When did this book of Exodus take place? And fortunately, we've got one text in the Bible that gives us the clue. It's 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. 1 Kings 6, 1. It's talking about the building of the temple. And it says that it was the fourth year of Solomon, so the fourth year of his reign. And it was also 480 years after the Exodus. So we can do the math. And let's do the math real quick here. First Kings 6 1, fourth year of Solomon's reign. And Solomon died in 930 BC. That's established by Thele's chronology. And Solomon reigned 40 years by himself and four years as a co regent with David. So you take 930 plus 40 plus 4, and you got 974, which is the beginning of his reign. And you take four years into his reign. 
which is 970 B.C., and then you go back 480 years from that, and that takes you to the year 1450. So we zero in on 1450 B.C. In fact, we can know even the time of year because they went out at Passover time. And you can go to the charts and find out when Passover was that year, and it happened to be on Thursday, March 10, 1450. You remember that? Come on, I'm trying to stir up your minds. Remember how we were so thrilled when the Passover angel passed over our houses and we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And old Pharaoh told us, get out, go, go. We were free at last. And so on Friday, March 11, we left Ramses, that city of Ramses, which today is Avaris. It was called then also Avaris, the capital city at the, near the land of Goshen. And we traveled down to Sukkot, which is now, we can look at the map at Tel Mashkuta in the Wadi Tumalat, in that place where the Nile River flowed due east at that time. Can you remember that? Remember how we started down south? We traveled that 22 miles, so excited. We're free. We had all of our caravans with us, and we headed out uh, There we go. Can I go back? Yes. And can I use this to show or not? Does this have a pointer? Is it this? I think it's this one. This one, okay. So we start there. That's Ramses, and we head down right to here to Tel El Mushkuta, right there. We go that 22 miles, and we spend that first Sabbath. Ah, we're free. We don't have to work. We don't have to build bricks. We don't have to worry about the lash of the whip. We can, we can. Here's, here's the Nile River today flowing through that same basic area. And there's some of the very bricks that you and I built. That's Tel Mashkuta from the very time when we were slaves. And there are some of those left right there in that site. And so we get before Friday, we get there in time to bake our unleavened bread so we can eat. And we spend Sabbath there at Sukkot, our celebrating in freedom the third day after Passover, we are free. Is that maybe a type of Jesus' resurrection on the third day? He gives his freedom, interesting possibilities. And we gather here for our three-day journey into the wilderness. So here we go. Notice it's flat throughout this area. Some people have tried to say that we, we crossed over by the Bitter Lakes or someplace like that, but no, it's totally flat here. There's no place where there's mountains until further down. Three days' journey we have to go. It's about, fifth, remember, it takes us, took us about 15 to 18 miles to hike, to walk that. But we were so excited it didn't seem like much. We headed out through the wilderness for that 50-mile trip, and as Ellen White reminds us, on the third day of their journey, our journey, we encamped by the Red Sea. So where would that bring us? Well, we travel from Telmashkuta on Sunday, and the distance, about 50, 55 miles, and we get not the Bitter Lakes. There's no mountains there, and there's only very shallow. Ellen White rightly puts here, the Hebrews were camped beside the sea whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south, a rugged mountain obstructed the, the further progress. Remember that, how God... We were headed out into the wilderness, and God all, all of a sudden, he says, no, you got to turn and go this way. And he takes us right into this cul-de-sac with the, the Red Sea right in front of us, and this mountain coming right down to the sea. There's no way we can go forward. And you remember how some of those, uh, none of us did that, but some of those Israelites were complaining, like, oh, God's already brought us into a trap. What's going on here? And there were some that were wanting to rebel at that time. And so God says, turn. Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi ha the mouth of the canal, and between Migdol and the sea in front of Mount baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. Well, there's only one mountain that comes down to the sea. 
We can know exactly where it is. Even if we, we've forgotten it in our memory, it's Jebel Ataka. And so here's a picture. There's Jebel Ataka coming down to the sea. Let's get a little closer to it. There's Jebel Ataka. There's no way around. And let's get our bearings as to where we are. Here we've come down, down to right there. There's the first mountain. There's no mountains anywhere in the northern part of Egypt until you get to there. That mountain goes right down to the sea and right there. Don't you remember? That's where we crossed. Let's just get a little better picture of it. Here's the modern map where here's Tel Mashkuta, and you go down 50 miles. There's the town of Suez. And about four miles south, there's Jebel Ataka. comes right down there and blocks the way. And right over there is the Springs of Moses. And many scholars agree with this, which Ellen White makes very clear. It's the mountain that blocks the way. And archaeologists are now recognizing that this indeed was the probable site. And so we arrive the third day, March 15. And Pharaoh's army catches up with us the next day. And here we are, trapped. Can, can you remember how, is the amnesia pulling away a little bit? Come on, get in this. This is our story. My point is, it's our story. It's not just their story. It's not a story of a long ago, far away people. It's not just our spiritual heritage about our spiritual ancestors. It's our personal diary that we're going to be studying. The book of Exodus is what happened to us as God wants it to come alive. If you catch this principle, the book of Exodus will be a new book for you because you will see that it is your story and you will see how every part of the event fits into our lives. And so, you remember the, how we were afraid, how we cried out to Moses, and how Moses said, don't be afraid. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so that night, we crossed the Red Sea on dry land and arrived the morning of March 17, 1450, on the other side. Now, I took my students a couple years ago here to the spot where I'm convinced is the crossing spot. And we, in our imagination, thought about that crossing. And it's interesting that the archaeologists now have studied this area, and this indeed is a land bridge that's about a half a mile wide, and it's only about 20 to 25 feet deep in this spot right here. Half a mile wide, four miles long. That's not white enough. It's not showing a good enough picture here. It's, it's, you do the math and there's plenty of time for two million people to cross if it's a half a mile wide and four miles long for us to get to the other side, going all night long with our cattle and with our, uh, with our wagons and all the rest. I know there's another theory going around that Ron Wyatt popularized about being way over on the Gulf of uh, Eilat. Um, this is one of the many reasons why um, I don't subscribe to that theory and it doesn't fit Ellen White's description here in Patriarchs and Prophets. Uh, but Randy Yonker, who was with you last month on the book of Genesis, can tell you more details because he examined Wyatt's theory and found it wanting in every point. Every time he tried to uh, corroborate it, it fell short of the evidence. But this fits the evidence. Now, I'm excited about this. I'm, I've been asked to write the commentary on the book of Exodus for the New Adventist Bible commentary, and I want to make it come alive. And so the more dates and the more places and the more reality we can get, the more, the more it becomes our story, the more it becomes our history. Now we're on the other side. And where I am holding my finger is there is Jebel Ataka coming down, and there's the, the sea, 
the Red Sea, and now here we are on the other side in the springs of Moses. You ask the people there at the springs of Moses, what's this famous for? They said, no problem. It's where Moses crossed the Red Sea. They all believe that, the, the people that actually live there. Now, here's what became fun to me. Because not only does it fit the biblical history, you notice I've just been talking about the biblical history, just the dates from the Bible. But when you now fit it with secular history, stunning corroboration takes place. Notice. There's only one pharaoh that died anywhere near 1450. No one died 25 years before or 25 years later. For this whole 50-year period, there's only one pharaoh that died, and that's Pharaoh Tutmos III. And we happen, just happen. I don't think there's any happenstance. We happen to have, for this one pharaoh alone of all the New Kingdom period, we know the exact date when he died from a biography of his general. Gives us the exact date. And guess what date he died, according to the Egyptian records? March 17, 1450. The exact date that we find from the biblical material. There he is, Tutmos III. And many scholars call him the greatest pharaoh of all time. We'll talk about him in two weeks as we go back and we want to look at our experience of slavery. We want to ask some questions about the plagues. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? What's that? How do we understand that? And we're going to tackle that, but we first will we'll look at the back historical background of that. Here is the mummy of Tutmos III, so they think, so they thought until they started doing x-rays of this mummy and they found out that it's not who it claims to be because this mummy is not the age that Tutmos III was supposed to be. Tutmos III was supposed to be over 60 years old, maybe up to 80 years old at this time, and this is a mummy that's like 20 years younger. So why did they bury the wrong person? It's obvious. They didn't find the body after he died in the Red Sea, and so they just grabbed the body and put it in the put it in the tomb, put it in the uh, casket. Uh, then look at the, look at these amazing events. After Tutmos III dies, his older son, not the one that died in the Red Sea, but his older son Amenhotep II, kept on reigning, and look what he did right after the death of his dad. All these things happen. First of all, a new breed of horses were introduced right at this time. Why did they need a new breed of stronger horses? Because all the horses were drowned in the, in the Red Sea. And they added then stronger chariots were introduced. They used to have four uh, spokes to the chariots. And right at this time, Right after 1450, they added another two spokes to make it six spokes, to make it stronger. Why did they do that? Because all the chariots got mired in the bottom of the Red Sea, and they realized, we've got to get stronger chariots. And then the capital of Avaris. I was reading a, a secular scholar that does not believe in the Exodus, but he says, we have no explanation of why suddenly out of nowhere they abandoned their capital right at this time. Why would they have abandoned it if you believe the biblical account? Because it was devastated by the plagues. And they, they couldn't, they knew that God was on the side of the Hebrews and they, they left inexplicably. And then right after that, old Amenhotep II goes to Palestine and he brings back a hundred thousand slaves. Why does he suddenly need 100,000 slaves right after Tutmos III's death? Because he lost the slaves when the Hebrews went free. So people ask, well, does the Egyptian record mention the Exodus? 
Well, they're not going to admit that an exodus took place, but here is all the circumstantial evidence that you may wish. Plus, and here's my favorite one, only in the tombs of these two pharaohs, Tutmos III and Amenhotep II, do we have a picture of the Red Sea and the dividing of the Red Sea. Look at these. Whoops. Uh-oh. I pushed the wrong button. How do I get out of it now? Let's see. There it is. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is in the tomb of Amenhotep II, and all around the walls of his tomb is a picture of water with dead bodies floating in the water. It's only in this one tomb, this one and the one of his dad, who actually died in the Red Sea. And here, not only did you have the, the, the pictures, and I've seen this myself, I've been in both of these tombs, and surrounding the tomb is this water with the dead soldiers going. But also there's this picture with some of their gods standing on water and then an opening in the water. An opening. And that is the symbol of an enemy or enemy forces. And here is an opening through the water. And only in these two tombs. We have had tombs of hundreds of the pharaohs and only in these two does it have those pictures. That's pretty exciting to me. And so on that day, March 17, we sang the Song of Moses on the seventh day of unleavened bread, which was to be a feast of the Lord. And Miriam and Moses lead the singing. And do we have the record of that song? Where is it found? Exodus, six, Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Now here's the picture where I, I'm convinced they actually were. This, this is where they were camped as they sang the Song of Moses. And our group decided we were going to sing the Song of Moses there. And I didn't tell the sound guy that I've actually got a video. Do you think it's going to play? We'll see what happens. So I go to the next one. And my daughter, I'm going to say she's Moses here. There's Moses, Rahel Wells, who teaches Old Testament at the, at the religion department. And this is the song. It's a very ancient tune, but it's taken from the very words of Exodus 15. So open your Bibles to Exodus 15. And let's look at the first couple of verses. And let's see if we can hear this song that we took on sight of uh, the singing of the Song of Moses. Can you, he, he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into Imagine the sea. Imagine this is you singing this song of Moses. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, will now become my victory. My strength, my song, is now become my victory. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him. Everyone, the Father is God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Hey! All right. 
Now, this is the song. There's the, there's the tune, but here's the words. You heard the tune. Let's just, let's just try to Let's just try to sing this song. Just pull back your amnesia and let's just join in. You heard the tune and let's just join with me. Keith, I know you know this tune, so help me out, okay? And, and the rest of you that may know this. So here's the words. Uh, join with me. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Again. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, is now become my victory. Again. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song is now become my victory. The Lord is God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him again. The Lord is God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Hey! All right. That's the song of Moses. Now, just in a couple more minutes here, if you look at the book of Exodus, and the whole book of Exodus is in a, what we call a chiasm, I hate technical words, so a mountain climbing structure, where you go up one side of the book, and then there's the center, the top of the mountain, then you go down the other side, and the very center of the book, the whole book of Exodus, is this chapter 14, just before the Song of Moses, verses 30 and 31, where it summarizes the message of the book. Here it is. So the Lord saved Israel that day, put your name there, saved you that day, out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore, and thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done. And so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. What's the heart of the book of Exodus? The Lord has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. And our response, will you believe? Will you reach out and accept this great fact that God has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Thank you for letting me take us back and strip away our amnesia. And we'll have prayer here to conclude our time together. Let's Dear Lord, we've tried to look at the, the historical background and the geographical setting and the times of long ago. But Lord, we've tried to do more. We've tried to follow your counsel to see this as our story as our personal diary. We were there. We are to consider as if we were Pharaoh's slaves. And Lord, we are now to consider that we not only were Pharaoh's slaves, but we have been slaves to sin. And just as we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from slavery in Egypt, so now we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from slavery to sin. And we can go forth, Lord, looking at you who brought the new exodus as you hung on the cross and as you stretched out your arms as the Passover lamb and you, you died for us. And we can look forward to that time that's coming soon when we will, according to Revelation 15, once more sing the song of Moses on the sea of glass. And it will have not only the first stanza, the song of Moses, but the second stanza, the song of the Lamb. 
and we will sing, Great and marvelous are your ways, O Lord, King of saints. Lord, I just pray that we may decide here tonight that not one of us will be missing from that final exodus, not just from the penalty of sin or even from the power of sin, but from the very presence of sin, where we can spend eternity with you, our great God and Savior. Thank you, Lamb of God, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.